Living with a Body in Space with Christina Sauer, Associate Editor, Nat Geo Kids. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. Uh, this week, we're going to be looking at the one thing every space traveler is going to have in common. They'll all be living with a body in space. Later in the show, we're going to be joined by Christina Sauer, Associate Editor for National Geographic Kids, talking about their new release, Why the Human Body. Now, for the foreseeable future, people venturing out exploring the final frontier are more than likely to have bodies of one form or another, right? Right? You know, at least until that whole brain in a jar thing is perfected, huh? Now, human bodies evolved on Earth, so our bodily systems are designed, more or less, to function on our home planet. Now, this is not necessarily good news if you're intending to live on the Moon or Mars. What? Howdy, partner! I'm Risky Ridge, rancher here at Risky Ridge Ranch. Seeing you planet slickers stepping out into space here. Well, I reckon a fella just has to help you out before you get yourself messed up in all leaks of trouble. I'm an old hand out here at Risky Ridge Ranch. If you're looking to stay out of danger best than you can, and know what sort of risk you're wrestling with out here. If this is the word you're looking to remember. It's rich, like me. Risky Ridge. R is for space radiation. I is your isolation and confinement there. And D gives you your distance from Earth. Are you listening there? Are you listening? Pay attention now. You got your gravity fields for G, and E is standing in for hostile or closed environments. And those don't sound the least bit attractive, if you're asking me. Also, space cows are the genuine deal out here. You can count on it. So just bear watching where you're stepping on. We don't want to mess up your fancy earth boots. They sure is pretty. Well, gotta head off now, partner. But next time you're out in space, you look up your buddy, Risky Ridge. As Risky goes riding off into the sunset, we welcome Christina Sauer, Associate Editor for National Geographic Kids to the show, talking about their new release, why the human body? Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are happy to be joined by Christina Sauer. She is Associate Editor at Nat Geo Kids, and she's here to talk to us about their new work, uh, Why the Human Body, 99 Awesome Answers for Curious Kids. Welcome to the show, Christina. Thank you so much for having me. I, mean, I can't wait to talk about this great bug. Oh, great. I, I, I just love this book. Um, so first, why did Nacho decide to put out this book focused on the human body for kids and how did it come about? 
Yeah. So actually, Why the Human Body is like the sister to a bigger book that came out that was just titled Why, over 1,111 answers to everything. Um, and so we we had a lot of success with this book. And it was broken down into chapters, everything from why about animals to the human body. And after that, we we're like, you know, if people love this so much, we should just keep going. There were so many an questions and answers that we couldn't include in that original book. So we took it we decided we we're going to make smaller subject matter books with as much information packed in there as we could possibly get of just that classic kid question, why? So everything from we start with anatomy to like brain and your senses and genetics to the really gross stuff about the body. And then like, get to that. Oh, for sure. That's like the kid's <laughs> favorite part, right? <laughs> so like the future of, of our bodies and what's going on um, research out in the field. Hmm. And so, got to ask, what are, what are some of your favorite things about the book? What are some of your favorite bits? Oh, it's so hard to pick just one, but I will say one of the favorite sections of mine uh, is the growth section, which we are getting to. And then also the sections on the brain. I love learning about, like, why is our brain so wrinkly? And it turns out that it's because the brain actually... Most people think that if you have a bigger brain that you're going to be smarter. That's not the case at all. What actually happens is the brain folds into itself, creating those wrinkles. And to do that, it gets more surface area and allows for like the neurons to be closer to they can fire more often. And so we've seen like in the most intelligent people, there is more wrinkles in their brain. It's not bigger. So the person with the most wrinkles on their brain was actually Albert Einstein, which we, we include in the in the book, just as little fun facts. It's pretty amazing. Okay, we're gonna uh, we're gonna go straight for it. Great. What is gross? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and we aren't afraid. Like this section. So honestly, the whole book is. We say it's catered to ages like eight to twelve, but realistically, you could read it to as young as your six year old. There's lots of pictures and quizzes and games, but it also is really relevant for like adults who get asked these questions why or honestly want to know more. And this gross section in particular is the questions that kids ask you or that parents really actually want to know the answer, mm -hmm. but we didn't know. And so we can just read it instead. We don't have to ask somebody and feel embarrassed or the kid <laughs> or not know how to answer the kid. So everything from why do I throw up? Most kids think, oh, it's just because I'm sick. And actually, it's just the body's re response to like a foreign thing that is it's like, uh, I need to get rid of this, whether that's you ate spoiled food or you do have a virus and it needs to get that out of your body. Um, why do I have bad breath? Well, that's because there's bacteria in your mouth. And when you eat, it breaks down some of that food and releases some sometimes pretty smelly chemicals. Um, and then also the one that we, we all laugh when we see is why do people pick their noses? It's a question that you, I'm sure, have asked why are you picking your nose? But instead we actually wonder why. Um, and it's because there's just some irritants. Sometimes our mucus hardens and it just creates little pieces that honestly, it's a natural instinct to just want to get out of your nose so you can breathe because it is a way we breathe. And we've even seen it in like chimps and apes also try to get that out. And usually they use sticks or their fingers because we got to breathe. <laughs> just, just try to make sure, you know, you're not in front of a TV camera or something. Well, while doing it. <laughs> yeah, right? Make sure make sure it's in the privacy of your own home or in the car. <laughs> <sighs> so what makes this important? Why is it so vital for kids to learn about the human body and human biology? Yeah, so for me, I feel like one of the first things we teach kids or the first questions we ask is like, Where's your nose? Where's your belly button? Where's your head? And kids, we love and we delight when kids can identify those things. So that's some of the first concepts that they ever learn, our body parts. And then as they get older, I'd say around six, seven or eight, suddenly they're asking, well, but why? Why do I breathe air? And then they start to understand that we need oxygen. There's oxygen in the air and it helps our cells function. So the reason why we really focus on anatomy and physiology with kids is it's because they need to know what's going on in the world around them. They're also very curious. Mm. But even beyond that, I mean, if you think about it, what's the one scientific wonder that you interact with every single day? It's your own body, body yeah. and you live in it. And it can start, it's kind of the foundation of all different sorts of sciences, whether it's the brain and electro electricity and 
neuroscience or it's chemistry and what you breathe in and how you breathe out air and different um, chemical and gases that you breathe in and out, whether it's how you digest food, literally everything starts from there. Whether What about sports? We talk about all the time. There's a physics of how your body works and also there's a physical fitness and and you need to know how the your muscles work, your cardiovascular system works in order to just practically live life. And then that lets you explore beyond and have have a, a curiosity about nature and the world because you understand yourself. And it's one thing we pretty much all have in common is that we all have a body. It's true. And it also makes everybody understand another person more when you understand these functions, right? Because like you said, at the end of the day, we're all very similar. There's differences, but we're all pretty similar. Hmm. And so how can parents use this book uh, to help teach kids? Absolutely. So for me, I think of this this book, it's coming out at the perfect time. It's right as summer is starting. Throw it in the car for when you're going on a, a road trip. You could play a trivia game with it, sit around the campfire. Um, also, it's kind of fun as kids. I mean, if you set it up that, hey, I don't know the answers to these questions. I feel like every kid wants to outsmart the parent, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a great way to do it. Or a kid, if a kid asks a question, it's a really great resource and toolkit for parents to be like, hey, I actually don't know the answer to that question or learn together and opening it up to that page. And usually we'll have a question that is very relevant to what ch children are asking right now, and they can read through it together or play the games. The book is super conversational. So it feels like your best friend is talking to you as you read it. Hmm. And I, I know that Nat Geo puts together a lot of these books, which are, you know, little little short facts on different subjects, which I, which I absolutely love. And uh, one of the things I really love about that format is because you can just open up to any page and, you know, shout across the breakfast table, hey, did you know that the emperor penguin is, you know. <laughs> but I also think for kids, it helps engage reluctant readers, doesn't it? Absolutely. Well, and that's the one nice thing about this book. I will say it's not a book that you have to read cover to cover or sequentially. You can start, I recommend you start in the anatomy section and it kind of gives you a refresher or an introduction to basic anatomy concepts that will be talked about throughout the rest of the book. But if you as a kid don't necessarily love reading, but you really have a burning question that you want to know about, say, what, where do I taste things on my tongue? Which right, we'll talk right. about those in a second, because that's a myth. Um, you go to that question, and naturally you're going to start reading about it because you're interested in it. So you don't have to read every single page to get to the question you want to. You can just flip through it. And we purposefully at Nat Geo make sure that all the photos and the graphics and everything are really exciting, colorful, and engaging. And also, like, the questions are questions that the kids would have asked them. So it's not going to be something that like, oh, I'm at school. What is osmosis? How does that work? You know, it's more like, mm -hmm. okay, why, why do my cheeks turn red when I'm running? I'm really, you know, right. why don't I like cilantro? <laughs> um, and um, so, and so educators can also probably use this book as um let's say curriculum adjacent is curriculum adjacent materials to yes. add into their lesson plans can't they oh absolutely this could be a great library book it can be a book it honestly could be a great like book club or um book when you have to do your book reports um it's an easy one that teachers can go to and if they're looking for a specific subject it's already laid out in our, our different sections and they can bring it to the class. And it's got a lot of practical applications as well as it goes beyond just the human body. You'll see a lot of animal facts in there too. So it'll right. be like, yeah, our blood is red, but there's some octopus and spiders that also have different colored blood, like blue. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And according to Star Trek, Vulcans have green blood, right? So no you gotta find all the different well and that's the other thing too which i think for teachers they'll like this too a lot of our facts we go into real like the questions we go into real detailed answers but then we throw out some fun facts that it that kind of sparks your curiosity you're like wait so so that octopus has blue 
blood, but, but why? And then they'll go and they can research it or look it up or find out themselves. Mm. And do you think that that helps? I'm wondering like how, you know, this book can get kids excited about, uh, about the human body, you know, about biology and what, what is it that you would hope that kids take from this? You know, I hope one that they are, they learn something that they didn't know before, or they have an answer to something that they've been wanting to know or have not even thought about either. But I will say one of my favorite things about this book is a lot of these questions are, like we said, kid-friendly questions. So the ones that they would ask all the time, but we make it very clear that these aren't just kid questions. These are actually the questions that scientists are actively researching and ask themselves as their hypothesis. We include some explorers that are aspirational, like a neuroscientist and a human biologist. And we talk about what they're doing in these fields and the questions they asked. And then when you get to the final section, which is the future section, that's where it gets really interesting. Because the truth is, we admit a lot of these we don't have the answer for, but people have asked these questions and they're thinking about it. And I'd like to think that one of the kids who opens up that and reads a question is going to be the person who solves it one day. Hmm. Hmm. Um, and so what started you down a life of science? I've forgotten writing and education. Yeah, so I probably would say I started as a kid. I loved writing. I would write lots of little books on my own. And then I was really fascinated by the sciences. They just kind of captivated me. I lived out, out in rural America where we had animals and I was constantly playing in the grass and it was really, really beautiful. And, and we had kind of a, a major event in our family where my sister was, she's a brain cancer survivor and it was due actually to an environmental contaminant. And as a nine-year-old little girl, I didn't understand what was going on. Why were people so scared? What's happening? And the fact that parents or adults couldn't explain it to me as a kid was really, it was such a moment where I felt powerless. And I realized I never wanted to feel that way, and nor should any child not have access to those kind of resources where they can learn about what's happening to them or, or what things they're, they're concerned about or an issue or even fun facts about the human body. So mm -hmm. that really drove me to go into this, this fun like science communication realm where it's really powered by storytelling as well as education. And that's why we're in at Geo. We're we're the experts at what we do, and we love to embrace child curiosity and exploration, and really just present them with the coolest information, in sometimes very serious manner, and other times just playful, fun. I want to go tell my friends about this kind of way. <laughs> and finally, what what is next for you? What, what are you working on now? Oh my goodness, I have a couple of projects that have not been announced yet, which I'm very excited about. Um, so stay tuned in the reader format. There's about to be some really fun. Those are our very specific age level and subject matter books that will be coming out next year in 2024. And I'm actually working on, um, there's an Explorer Academy series. So for those kids who love fiction and can't get enough of chapter books, we have an incredible Explorer Academy series that will be continuing that's all about kids who go to this special school and can go explore the world. And there's always some crisis that they have to solve. Uh, that sounds great. I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, I'm so glad you should read it. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah I, hope to, <laughs> I hope to have you back on this show and talk about that. Oh, I would love to. Excellent, excellent. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Christina. It was fabulous talking with you. Oh, it was same here, James. I hope you have a great rest of your weekend. And I really appreciate you inviting me to the show. Yay. All right. And that was Christina Sauer, Associate Editor at Napcheo Kids. Check out their new book, Why? The Human Body, 99 Awesome Answers for Curious Kids. Let's poke on down through the risks of Ridge. First up is R, space radiation. Now, this is exactly as desirable as it sounds. The Apollo missions of the 1960s and 70s are the only time so far that humans have traveled beyond the protective Van Allen radiation belts of Earth. 
If all goes to plan, that's soon going to change with the flight of Artemis too. Uh, here on Earth, these giant donuts in space mm, and our atmosphere protect us against the most harmful radiation from the sun and elsewhere in space. <clears throat> However, people and animals traveling beyond low Earth orbit are going to face cosmic rays, radiation from coronal mass ejections or CMEs erupting from the sun, as well as wayward ionized atomic nuclei and free electrons. Free electrons! This radiation salad increases risks from cancer due to the central nervous system and changes to the DNA. Now, shielding either from structures or by being buried in alien landscapes are gonna, is going to be needed for spacecraft and habitations of the future. Isolation is a very real problem in space as crews currently top out at about six or seven people. However, as more people reach out into space, communities and civilizations are going to grow. The need to work together to survive will tie these interplanetary villages together, reducing the effects of isolation in these far-flung hamlets. My brother started reading ghost stories. Didn't help. Got the sniffles? House calls from doctors aren't even a thing anymore in the U.S., never mind in a space station orbiting the moon, okay? Now, this lack of medical access to, and to Earth and its troves of medicines is due to your distance D. You remember, you remember the reach thing? Okay. Gee, gravity. Got dreams of living in space? A lack of gravity can certainly bring you down. Ironically. Gravitational forces on the moon are just one-sixth of what they are on Earth, while standing on Mars is going to have you weighing in at just one-third of what you do on our home planet. This may sound like a great weight loss plan. It is not. Just a few minutes of exposure to microgravity can cause bodily fluids to swell up in your upper body, giving you that oh-so-attractive chipmunk look. Mandragora, I can no longer sit back and allow microgravity infiltration, microgravity indoctrination, microgravity subversion, and the international microgravity conspiracy to sap and impurify all of our precious bodily fluids. Space travelers lose bone density and muscle mass over time and can suffer vision problems. Exercise and proper nutrition can help mitigate some of these issues, but they present serious challenges for the long-term habitation in space. Finally, give me an E! e. That's all I got. Closed and hostile environments. Uh, being cooped up in a tiny habitat with eight other people 385,000 kilometers from Earth might seem like quite a getaway until a virus starts going around. Recycling air and water aboard space-borne habitations is going to remain a necessity, at least for the foreseeable future. But improvements to these systems and the extra space provided by larger outposts should work to overcome these challenges. The risks of ridge present obstacles to the large-scale permanent habitation of space. However, these challenges can be overcome in whole or part through technology and the movement of more people into the cosmos bringing our species beyond our planetary birthplace. Next week on The Cosmic Companion, we're going to be planting the seeds of steam. Talking with Ariane Su Tu, senior editor at National Geographic Kids Books. How cool, huh? Make sure to join us starting on the 1st of July. Now, the following week, uh, 8th of July, is our half season finale. We are going to be looking at the greatest mysteries in the universe. We'll be joined by acclaimed physicist and author Lawrence Krauss, author of The Physics of Star Trek, discussing his new work, 
the edge of knowledge. Take a ride on over to thecosmiccompanion.com or .net and sign up for our newsletter and we'll rustle you up an episode into your email inbox every week. Clear skies.